Welcome to our second of 11 webinars in our 2024 Women in Leadership Executive Speaker Series, with this one specifically focused on women leaders in state government. I'm Dr. Susan Madsen, Founding Director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, and also I'm the Karen Hay Huntsman, Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University, and I will be the host and, and the panel moderator today. And this event furthers the mission of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, which is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. And we serve Utah and its residents first by producing relevant, trustworthy, and applicable research, and second, creating and gathering valuable resources, and third, convening trainings and events that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. And we are also, I don't have this in my script, but um, the backbone organization for A Boulder Way Forward for Utah. And so if you haven't heard about A Boulder Way Forward, please look at uh, abolderwayforward.org and learn more today. I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, the Utah Education Network, U UEN, the John M. Huntsman School of Business and USU Extension. So I have two friends here today, and I'm excited to be able to um, introduce both of them. So let's start with Nubia Pena. And Nubia is the Senior Advisor on Equity and Opportunity for Governor Spencer Cox, and also the Director for the Utah Division of Multicultural Affairs. She is a former member of the Utah Juvenile Defenders Attorneys, where she advocated for youth rights during detention, and uh, other proceedings. She is certified by the National Juvenile Defender Center as a juvenile uh, training immersion program facilitator. Nubia, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me and my sister, Sophia. We're excited for the conversation. Thank you. And Sophia uh, DeCaro is the executive director of the governor's office of planning and budget, and a senior advisor to the governor as well. And prior to her role, she was a chief compliance officer for an investment uh, uh, investment advisory firm in Salt Lake City. And prior to that, she spent 15 years with the state of Utah in the governor's office of planning and budget. She ran the Utah State Data Center, performing demographic and economic analyses and was later a lead budget and policy analyst. And then she served in the governor's office of economic opportunity, first as finance director and later as deputy director and chief operating officer. And after working under four administrations in the state government in various roles, she served a term in the Utah State House of Representatives representing North, Northern West Valley City, and she also serves on many other boards and commissions and was recognized uh, recently in Utah's Business Magazine as one of Utah's 30 women to watch. Welcome, Sophia. Thank you. It's so great to be here with both of you. I'm really excited for the conversation. And I'm so glad we have so many of you joining today. And I want to get started. And Nubi, I'll ask you this question first. Let's get started by having both of you give some background on your career path. How did you get to where you are now? So Nubia, let's start with you. Actually, Susan, if we can start with Sophia, she's been oh. a longtime mentor of mine. And so I oh, adore that's her, perfect. Her to her. So Sophia, we're kicking it off with you. Oh, Excellent. wow. Well, that's humbling because Nubia is someone I very much look up to. And she, I, I feel very lucky for all of you because she just leads with her heart and is uh, one of the greatest people you'll ever have a chance to interact Amen. with. Amen. Yes. Um, uh, very much someone who leads from the heart. Um, okay. Well, I actually would be, it would be better for me to start so I don't have to follow Nubia because it, it is hard to follow, <laughs> follow Nubia. Um, uh, well, I guess a uh, career path. Um, I actually was on my way to go to law school. Uh, I had law school on my mind. I um, I come from a, a military family. My um, my father was a United States in the United States Marine Corps. He was stationed in Japan. That's where he met my mother. 
brought her back to the United States. Uh, my sister and I were both born in Oceanside, California, on a on a, uh, a military base, uh, Camp Milton, and um, we ended up in Utah because my my father actually grew up in Utah. Uh, and, and so we, uh, very, as very young children ended up growing up in Carbon County, um, oh. many of you may not know where Wellington, Utah is, but, uh, Wellington is just outside of Price. And that's where I, uh, grew up as a child, a very rural area. And, um, and he, uh, he later left the Marine Corps, joined, um, the Utah National Guard and was a coal miner there. So I was a co I'm a coal miner's daughter. Uh -huh. um, but uh, for the longest time, because my mother was from Japan and I had this whole family in Japan that I uh, wasn't able to effectively communicate with. Um, and, you know, I had the connection with the military that I, I very much felt like I'm going to be working for the State Department and that's my path and I'm going to law school and that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and I, I worked toward that, ended up getting into a, a couple of, uh, I had a, a couple of opportunities to, to go in that path. And then, um, also had this opportunity to do an internship with the governor's office planning and budget. And I thought, well, you know, I will just defer those things and take this opportunity. Cause it sounds like a great, uh, opportunity. And then I can always come back. Well, never went back. So I happened. I started in this office as an intern 23 years ago and just kept working my way up into different roles. Uh, after seven years, ended up in the governor's office of economic development and then um, had a great, great experience there. Uh, uh, lived through the downturn in 2008 and uh, was, went through some very difficult cuts. Uh, then had the opportunity to um, you know, I have three children and, and, uh, the higher you go and the more responsibilities you take on, um, the, the harder it is. I was doing 80 hour weeks and I thought, you know, I need to find a way I, I was on my, you know, I had my third baby. I had two budget babies and one economic development baby. And I, I literally did plan their births around the special session. I know that's probably demented, but it's a true story. And uh, I, I thought, well, you know, I've been following the legislature for all these years. I started looking at my own district and realized, hey, maybe I should run for legislature and take a break and be with my children more. And so that's what I did. I, I took a mm -hmm. risk, ran for office. I had no idea what I was getting into and never run for office before. I was always on the policy side of things and threw my name in the hat, decided to go for it. Election night lost. Uh, and I lost by like 23 votes. It was devastating, oh, no. it was like, you know, size of a classroom. And, um, and that was the year that vote by mail was implemented. And so two weeks later found out I actually won by like 223 votes. And, uh, and so I had the opportunity to serve in the legislature, took some time off and just focused on being a lawmaker and being with my kids and, uh, um, you know, found myself back into uh, uh, work, uh, went back into um, the private sector at that point while I served in the legislature, stayed involved in a number of different boards and commissions, and then found myself exactly 20 years later uh, was when Spencer Cox uh, became mm -hmm. governor. So I found exactly 20 years later, found myself back in the same office. Um, and that was three yeah. years ago. So here I am. <laughs> And uh, back in the budget office, I, I, I love uh, public budgeting and finance. I was able to teach as an adjunct instructor for the MPA program at the University of Utah, uh, public budgeting and finance. And so it's uh, it's been a real pleasure and treat. But I will say the most enjoyable experience I have is working with amazing colleagues like Nubia. Um, it, it makes the job easier to do when when you're surrounded by great passionate people who are in it to do great things and I also get to work with Susan Matson in a variety of different ways too so anyway it's just it's been a, a, a great treat and uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate today. Well thank you so much and Sophia one of the things that I can tell though that even your time in the legislature helped you with what you're doing today. Your time at uh, in the office that's now called GOEO, the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity, I am sure that led to your understanding to, yeah, I mean, you learned every, and, and being a mother, I bet that helps. 
Yes, absolutely. And I will tell you, I am uh, more effective in my role in this office because of my experience in the legislature. And I ironically end up getting more bills passed in this role than I did as oh. a lawmaker too, which is another story, but um, highly rewarding. Thank you so much. And and Nubia, now now that you've heard heard uh, Sophia's background, tell us a little bit more about you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Susan. And again, for that beautiful introduction um, and invitation. But before we dive in, I do just want to acknowledge that Sophia is being very modest about what she does for the state of Utah. And really, we are so lucky to have her in her role because she is not just running the office. She's meeting with partners to understand some of the gaps. And she's pulling me in and the various people who are connected to communities to make sure that we are uplifting the budget needs to the highest levels of leadership. So I really wanted to just start off by honoring her and thanking her for her and her team and all they do um, so that we can really fund some of the most important things, which I know we'll talk about here in just a moment, but she was instrumental in the $53 million ask that was made last year for uh, domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, and so again, mm -hmm. it's team effort, right? It's consistently working with folks on the front lines, behind closed doors and various levels of leadership. And of course, Dr. Madsen, you know, thank you for all that you do with the data, the research and uh, creating these platforms for us to convene and make sure that we are understanding how leadership is uniquely influenced by the perspective of women, of allies, of champions and of people who love Utah. So with that, now I'll just tell a little bit about my story and my background. I was born in Mexico, raised in Philadelphia, and now have called Utah home for the last 23 years. I have started on the front lines as a direct service provider. So, so much of my work, my, um, the, my lens in which I approach my position now as a senior advisor to the governor, as a director for a division, is uniquely informed by the lived experiences of survivors of harm. Um, I served with law enforcement at Unified Police Department, formerly the Sheriff's Office, um, working as a victim advocate for domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, homicides, and really any type of violent crime that, that, that occurred. And while you're sitting there with people understanding in their darkest moment, the most complicated series of incidents that have led to, to that particular um, exchange where I'm sitting across from them and helping them understand their rights, helping them understand the judicial process, helping them understand the next steps they can get to safety, um, it humbles you. And it really helps you understand that policies and laws um, are sometimes a bit dis connected unless we really understand the people that are impacted by those laws and policies. And so I've been so thankful that the many years that I was serving in that capacity then led me to pursue law school. So similar to Sophia, right? That was a dream. It was it was something I had wanted to do because I saw uniquely behind closed doors and within the system how survivors were being treated or how some folks maybe didn't quite understand the unique nuances of why people don't report or why they don't trust law enforcement or why we needed to do different strategies and practices to work better with our law enforcement community, which I will say we have seen huge growth and strides and the bridges that have been built. Um, but I wanted to be a part of that table and that discussion and that process. So I recognized that law school was the next step. But I have to tell you, being an immigrant to this country, being raised in a low socioeconomic household, um, speaking with an accent, whether it's Philly or Latina, you know, you choose, but um, I understood that this was going to be a hard journey and I was scared, but I prayed and I decided I will, I negotiated, let me just tell you all, I negotiated with um, with my God, which I'm very connected to my faith. And I said, I'm gonna apply to one law school. And if I get in, then that is the journey that you have called me to do and to engage and to follow. Um, and it so happened that I got in. And so that has now developed into a, a fabulous policy career where I have the incredible privilege of working with the Cox Henderson administration with phenomenal colleagues like Sophia and so many others that are really championing Utah. Um, and we do hard work. A lot of it is done behind closed doors. A lot of things people don't quite know, um, but this is also why we have the opportunity to collaborate in these spaces to bring a little bit of light to that, those efforts. And again, thank every single person that gets involved and that shows up. So thank you, Susan. That's just a very quick overview of, what, of how I've started in my career. 
Thank you so much. Such interesting background. And, and I can tell your passion, you know, your passion is coming out for both of you in the areas, uh, very different areas um, that you are managing, uh, but so important each. So one quick question for each of you, and Sophia, I'll go to you first. When you began your career, did you ever imagine that you would end up as a leader, especially as a woman, mom, uh, and and in the in state government? You mentioned that a little bit as well. Uh, when I was starting out, I did not. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mentioned earlier I was on this path. I knew what I wanted to do. I was going to law school. That's where I was going. I was going to work for the State Department so I could live in Japan and. Um, it didn't work out that way. And so, you know, I'm I'm here to say sometimes um, you just have to be flexible, but I will say I wouldn't change anything. Um, I kept being put in these money roles. Uh, every job I've had, for some reason, I'm dealing with money in some way, shape or form. Um, I'm not an accountant. Uh, I have an MPA um, and, you know, I, I focused a lot on policy and I, I didn't end up going to law school, but I've written bills. I've passed bills. Uh, I deal a lot with public policy and regulatory work. And so, um, you know, it, it's uh, it's been very interesting. Uh, so, no, I didn't see myself uh, going down this path. I knew I knew I wanted to do something related to government. I've always been really fascinated. I know, you know, even though my mother was an immigrant and uh, you know, not native to uh, the United States. I grew up watching CNN and Fox and all these uh, things. I had, a, you know, we had a, a business magazines in her home all the time. And she was very much into politics. She mm -hmm. could tell you any story about any politician. Um, even though she was an immigrant here, she was very much plugged into the political scene and knew a lot about public policy and all of that stuff. And so I think that influenced me. Um, and I knew I wanted to do something in government where I can see how things happen, how things work, uh, but I wasn't prescriptive on what exactly that would look like. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you a quick follow-up question, then I'll go to Nubia. And, and this follow-up is, so in your roles, you've dealt with money, like you said, but you've also been in roles for many years that you've become a leader. So what has motivated you through the years? Or sometimes it's motivation, sometimes it's just leaning in when people ask you to do things, to be a leader. What Has there been some motivation behind that? Oh, that was to you, Sophia. That's your yeah, follow -up. That was to you, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think if you're doing things you're passionate, about that you will naturally be inclined to, to lead out in whatever that might be. So, um, you know, I don't know that anyone wakes up saying, I wanna, you know, I wanna be a leader when I grow up, but um, I've learned over the years, like if you're doing what you love and doing, um, you know, what moves you to the core and helping others do what they're passionate about, even more importantly, um, that, that, that's that's what ends up happening. I I, I am very intentional about uh, people um, on my team, for example, putting them where their passions are, because then the work happens organically, and you know they're able to lead out and make things happen. Um, and instead of me, you know, being prescriptive on what that might look like, you if you put people where there's alignment with their passions, magic will happen. And um, oh and God. I think that is a lot of. Uh, what what ends up translating to you know what we're calling as leadership roles and and opportunities like that. That's such a good insight. And what we know from the research on women, thirty to forty percent more than men, women want to be where their heart and passion and where they feel purpose and calling. So that that is awesome. So Nubia, back to you. Same question initially. And that is, did you imagine you would end up being the leader you've become, especially in state government? No, oh, thank you for that question, Susan. No, and just as I mentioned, right, like when you think about my origin story or my background, I'm so thankful for an exceptional mother where she taught me lead with excellence wherever you're planted. Um, but recognizing, right, that there was very much that imposter syndrome of how could I be an attorney? How could I help lead and engage in policy discussions? Um, but I'm so thankful for the mentors and the people that planted those seeds in my heart that said, try, 
dream move forward um, because that gave me the courage to move in the direction where I now sit and I now engage and I now get to open doors and champion other people to think of themselves in these roles and capacities. And I think it's such an incredible privilege. It's incredibly humbling to think about um, being, you know, one of, of the administration senior advisors, but then also having direct access to individuals that are helping shape the state of Utah and how we have the opportunity to lift their voice and also make sure that they're at the table and how we do that can be complicated and challenging. But no, I've never once thought that this was going to be where I, I ended up. Um, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity and looking forward to what's next, especially when we think about how our next generation and next wave of leaders um, are seeing the potential, the opportunities, and the doors open. And so that's, I think, really our role is when we think about our current position, what are we doing to open doors? What are we doing to champion others? And how are we making sure we eliminate some of those barriers for entry? Thank you. And Nubia, just follow-up question for you. You and I, for those of you listening, Nubia and I work together often, every week, sometimes multiple times a week. Yesterday, a couple times. Um, mm -hmm. And so things get crazy. I feel it on my end. You know, you're hitting the legislative session, other things. What are some ways that you stay grounded and take care of yourself? You and I talk about that often. Yes. And, you know, I think it's um, really important because this conversation around self-care, especially for women in positions of leadership or women who are doing frontline services, um, sometimes gets dismissed as just like, you know, we'll get to it. But more than anything, I can tell you from a personal perspective, um, watching my mother who had a really hard life, um, her health is declining and um, watching her mobility be um, challenged. I, I understand how how short life is and how much we give. And sometimes our own body's mental health and well being is collateral to us trying to reach a certain goal. And um, unfortunately, I feel like I'm learning this a little late, but nonetheless, I'm learning it. And I, it's so important for us to remind each other that um, our cup must be full for us to be able to, to make the journey. And uh, we have to take care of ourselves. Um, again, not the prime example. I will be the first one to lift my hand to say that I do not do a great job, but I'm trying to be more intentional. And so every day I start off with, for me, a sermon. Every day I start off with something that will lift my spirit, give me the courage, remind me that the journey was never meant to be easy, but it will be rewarding. And um, I circle myself around people that whenever I'm feeling defeated, they remind me of my purpose and my worth. And that is something that I make sure that I give right back in turn, because I think for many of us, we um, we're caring so much. You know, I hear Sophia talking about being a mother. Um, you know, she was a legislator. She's leading this incredible team that is developing the budget for the state. Um, and I always ask her, sis, are you taking care of yourself, right? Because she matters. So let us be intentional about making sure as women, as leaders, as champions, as allies, we turn to the people that we see lifting and asking them, what are you doing to take care of yourself? How can I love you? How can I help you? Um, because when people do that to me, it reminds me to pause. It reminds me to take a break. It reminds me to breathe. And it reminds me that I deserve that moment. So. Thank you. And you given me that talk, that speech many times. So I appreciate that. And hopefully I have remembered to do that for you on occasion. Um, Sophia, I would love to have you just highlight a couple of things um, that you, that come out when you think of, you know, leading takes some skills and abilities and you somehow develop those along your career and life. What are a couple of things that come to mind on how you specifically feel like you have developed your leadership skills and abilities? Wow. Well, I I, I first have to just um, add on to the comments Nubia just made because um, I, I do think a, a great deal of uh, leadership is, um, you know, what you do for others or how, how you're looking out for others. Uh, I believe strongly like what you do comes back to you. And, uh, and, and, you know, part of, uh, part of taking care of yourself is, um, 
is very sometimes very difficult, especially for 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 mothers. Um, but I just I just want to give a shout out to Nubia because she does like part of how I take care of myself is by surrounding myself with people like Nubia. Uh, because it isn't, you know, it is it is uh, a difficult thing to do sometimes in these roles. So maybe tying that back into your question, just that is one of the things is um, to to you know I often have to uh, just anchor get anchored back into reality um, on what what do the what things really matter. Um, you know, I I. Uh, I, I agree that life is short. Uh, you know, I lost both my parents. I've uh, had a lot of loss in life too. And I've come to that realization, which also motivates me, right? Let's make sure that the time we have here, uh, that we're spending on uh, things that really matter and can, uh, uh, you know, multiply um, and, and, and make things better. I know it sounds cheesy, but uh, Truly, that is a motivation. Um, but you know, often we get forced into certain time frames. Um, like even you know, the administration is in a four-year window. Well, you've got four years to accomplish certain goals, and you know, um, some of us get really driven, and you get on that you know uh, tunnel vision. No, we've got to do this, this, and this. And I do think uh, because you 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 know you get um, inundated by demands from everywhere. Um, that one of the things I do to stay anchored is just uh, tell myself, well, it doesn't matter what happens today or how much we're able to accomplish on a goal. We know what the goals are, but, but you know, give ourselves a little bit of grace and remember like the sun is going to come up tomorrow, no matter what we do today, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. And, um, and that, you know, relieves a little bit of, of pressure too. Um, that it's okay if you're not able to do everything you're you're wanting to do. But I think it's uh, really important to try to stay anchored in that and in, in what really matters too. Um, and uh, and I also have to remind myself like, okay, my demeanor is impacting people around me. Yeah. So I have to be really careful. And when I find myself stressed out, try to try to ground myself again because I don't want that to negatively impact people around me. So I try to, you know, try to maintain um, a, a consistent demeanor when I can. But those are just some little things that I think, uh, you know, I think can help um, in, in, when you're in these types of roles. Thank you so much. And Nubia, anything to add there? But I also want to, I'm looking at time and, and lots of questions. And in a few minutes, I'd like to start pulling questions that are coming in as well from people listening in. But anything about that? But then I would love to have you share a few things about some, we all face barriers, right? Um, and, and you know, any barriers that you faced earlier in your career versus later and any advice, you know, you want to give related to that? Absolutely. So I think for, um, as, as I mentioned, right, with, with some of my, my beginning, um, I just didn't quite understand the process and the power of mentors, I think for me was a saving grace where uh, I very quickly learned to spot people that had not only the skill set I was hoping to develop in myself, but then also were approachable enough to understand um their power in being a bridge. And so the barriers, you know, not knowing how to navigate systems, not understanding how to be considered for certain roles, um, sitting across from people who had already walked through that path, who could orient me and give me at least guidance and direction was a, a critical piece of I think for me, um, self-development. Mm -hmm. But you know, when we think of the different leadership capabilities. We don't all start off as leaders, right? This is something that we also need to spend time developing and understanding, um, but leadership looks very different for people. So self-reflecting and considering what is the type of leader I want to be? Who do I want to be known for? What legacy do I want to leave behind? Um, and, and spending time journaling that, writing it down, 
thinking through that. So in five, 10 years, when life gets hard, you can go back and reflect and say, did I become that person? So the barriers were different, right? From access mm -hmm. to knowledge, to understanding, um, but people, mentors, champions, sponsors, leaders that saw my potential, that paused to ask me, how do I help you? How do I champion you? Um, I, I think is a really important um piece of this journey that I think for many of us, we need to trust that people will want to spend time with us. Um, I, I know Sophia has done that for people. I know I have done that for others, um, but that is an invitation to folks on the call today. If you see something in us where you would like to know more about how we developed our capacity in these spaces, reach out to us. We wanna make sure that we are investing in you as much as others invested in us. Oh, thank you so much. So one more quick question before I pull in a few from the audience, and then I'll come back to I have this whole list of awesome questions, but I don't want to make it about all my interesting questions. Um, but one more thing, um, Sophia, I know about well, both of you, you have this, um, we, we care about our sons and daughters and all Utahns, right? We do. But there's this soft spot that all three of us have in our hearts who are caring about empowering girls and women in our state. So, you know, what has pulled you? What are what are some motivations, Sophia, on, on, in that, that I know you just really care about that? Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I have children, as you know. I have two boys, one girl. Um, and I do, I think, you know, we are, of course, we're female, so we resonate. We, yeah. you know, especially as a, a young teen, there's so many things you go through trying to find out who you are and all of that. I think that journey um, helps us, uh, you know, try to help others to to navigate through that, knowing what we've experienced uh, to try to translate that experience and and help the you know the next generation. Um, maybe go through it easier than have an easier journey than we had by, you know, giving them tips and tricks and so they can skip the challenges we went through and just, you know, uh, learn from that. But I, um, I know that, uh, it's just, it is tougher, uh, in a lot of respects, uh, with the weight that you carry and have to go through and overcome, um, uh, and I could give a lot of different examples of why I'm saying that, but, uh, I, I know from a, the a, research, the research supports what you're saying, all of what you're saying. So it, it does. Um, and, and, um, and that's why, you know, I just, I, it has been a challenge and I would be lying if I said it wasn't. And so, um, you know, because I know that, uh, but I also know, like I'm doing what's right for what I know, um, is a, a path that I need to take. Um, and I want to make sure that everyone uh, is able to honor the path that they're uh, needing to take for themselves, right? And so, um, so anyway, I, I do think it's just important that, you know, what can we do to help inspire and make sure that um, the things that we have been able to overcome uh, in society that we're, at, we're able to keep, keep those benefits and not go backward, but also to, you know, continue to uh, make it make it better um, and create even more opportunity for the next generation coming in. And I mean that for everybody as well. Um, I always have to train my sons and and my daughter uh, and, and figuring out how to navigate through that, uh, how to navigate through society in the right way. And I don't none of none of us come with a manual. Um, and the kids certainly don't come with a manual either. But I think at the end of the day, we we all want to be better. Um, and we all want to make a better path um, than what we had for others. Um, and so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question effectively, no. but that, I think that's you, what motivates me. Yeah, I think you have, exactly. And one of the things I always remind myself and others about is as we strengthen what I call in, in the Utah Women and Leadership Project mission, as we strengthen the impact of our Utah girls and women, we actually strengthen our families. And we, and that includes our sons too. So this is not just women versus men, right? It's lifting all. So, so one more question before I open up um, and ask you some questions for the chat. Uh, Nubi, if you don't mind, 
I want to switch hers just a little bit. A quick question. So you went through law school and also you've you've been in some interesting industries and state government is one. So would you recommend, I'm really interested in this in your response, would you recommend your path and your profession to other people? We need good people in state government and local government. Can I just say that? Yes, no, absolutely. And that is exactly right, is that we do need great people, people who care, people who want to contribute to the well-being and the direction of the state. We need folks to get involved. And so I absolutely would uh, encourage, invite people to think about law school, to think about running for office, to think about getting, um, you know, it's engaging in state government, right? We've got great fellowships and internships, lots of ways to get your foot in the door. Um, but, you know, I do want to go back to the question about why do we care so much about this issue? And why is it so important for us also not to forget about our young men and boys? And I have such an important lived experience, I think, from both. So working on the front lines of domestic violence and sexual assault, Let's be very clear, this happens to everyone, regardless of gender, identity, background, race, socioeconomics. Um, disproportionately, we did see so many of our survivors identify as women. And sitting across from these individuals as they are piecing their life back together, whether it's trying to free themselves from abuse, um, trying to heal from a sexual assault, trying to navigate the harms of a violent occurrence, you are humbled by the complexities of their journey. And you understand that for many of them, because of what culture says or society says about um, women, there's such conflict, right? How can I be strong and taken, care, uh, taken seriously? Um, how can I lead and be assertive? How can I heal? and be true to myself. And there's all these questions that are coming up and sometimes there's no good space to find those answers. And for me, I'm passionate about creating not, not only spaces like this on this forum, but for other leaders to know that we have to be compassionate mm -hmm. about the many ways in which people navigate this world um, and that our understanding might be very different than theirs. And we have to make room for their truths, right? Um, and I think compassion is just so critical. It is so absolutely um, needed in this time where I think, unfortunately, we see the great divide where people say, I'm right and you're wrong. Um, and what's that middle ground where it says, I see you. I see you. I honor you. I hold space for you. Um, and so for our girls, I want more of that. But when I was a, an attorney in the juvenile justice system, predominantly my clients were boys. And I also see them missing from these conversations about leadership. And I also see them missing from conversations about mental health and healing. And so many of them had trauma. So I love, Susan, that we are creating more spaces where we're saying it doesn't have to be either or. We can champion our children, we can champion our leaders, we can champion each other because we have to be, we have to move beyond the scarcity mentality. Yeah. There is enough for us. There is enough for especially spaces for healing and we need to normalize those conversations. Mm -hmm. So I really just wanted to talk about like why I care, but then come back to this idea of, um, you know, how do we make sure we we recruit people? And it's spaces like this as well. The invitation, be courageous, truly believe that you have the skill sets that are needed, trust that you have the capacity to show up, to be a voice that might be missing from the table. Um, and we need more people who love Utah. So I love that. And and what you said just really resonated with me in terms of compassion, because that's something. I have had to work with it. When you understand unconscious bias, we, we go to judgment first. We judge first. That's kind of a natural thing for a, most people in some way, but we can train ourselves to judge. Like when we're driving a car or something, we like, 
they're this or that, you know, they're driving crazy for this or that. But then we can train ourselves and I'm still working on that to be compassionate. So I love, I love that. So one of actually two of the questions I'm going to give you, um, I'm combining them from, from the uh, uh, folks that are listening in and thank you for all of you to be in here today and engage in this conversation. So I'll read you word for word what one said, but I, I then I'm going to twist it a little bit. But have you ever found yourself acting in a way that was untrue to yourself? So I'm going to change that a little bit because the research talks about how women struggle sometimes and more masculine, especially being authentic to how they they engage with, you know, the whatever setting they're in, um, whether in personal life or career. And how, how has that you too come across to me as very authentic? Um, but have you been in that space and how have you resolved that I've just got to be where I'm at? Although you, we can't bring everything to, to every situation. So, um, that's a big question, but there were a couple and I wanted to pose that who, who wants to take that one? Sophia, you're looking thoughtful on that when you're like, no, give it to Nubia, right? <laughs> it's kind of a hard one. Go ahead, Nubia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's a really important question, especially when we're talking about leadership, right? And the fact is, is that um, we have to learn to, in so many ways, again, remember our core, right? Mm -hmm. I, it was it was a really helpful meeting this morning with my team. And one of our young leaders on there reminded me of a quote. Um, it, it's by... Um, She's a woman hall of famer, Maggie Kuhn. And it says, speak the truth, even if your voice shakes. Right? Oh. And, I have to, and I have to tell you, I oh. love my team so much because they teach me so much about leadership as well. And I love that reciprocity. And so, um, and, and that stuck with me, right? Speak the truth, even when your voice shakes. Um, being in state government, right, we negotiate a lot of spaces where we we have to abide by certain parameters. But what I've been grateful for is that I've been um, led by and I have worked with and I continue to work with people that understand my role is to bring the voices that have been most invisible and marginalized and erased to the center. Um, and even when it's not popular, I'm still allowed to speak. And um, and it is terrifying in spaces. But if we don't use these moments, um, how can we be trusted in the positions that we hold? Um, and again, when I say a lot of these things happen behind closed doors, most folks don't know what we navigate and deal with daily. They don't understand the pressures or the weights of what we do. Um, but I'm grateful again that the core has not shifted for me. And I have, and that's again why I spend my mornings, right? With my my um, my anchoring rituals, my moments of of making sure I, I put my feet on the ground and understand what are we doing today. And it's not going to look the way that you know certain people might want. Um it, we're not gonna be able to please you know people on on all sides. But I, I'm I'm grateful that we we show up and we try, and so it's hard, but we try. And Nubia, you did you see me? I got teary eyed. You got we get each other teary eyed. You are just a gift to the state of Utah, and to me and my life. So thank you. Nope, nope. I where's my Kleenex? Okay, we're done. <laughs> okay. It's true. It is. It is true. We are so very lucky to have Nubia in her heart. Um, right. It's. It's more. It's not just Nubia. It's like what Nubia brings to the table, and it's that. It, it's that heart and passion and um and heart and hands. That combination of head, heart, hands. 
Um, and I love you. you all and, and and I love you like we, this is not about me so I really appreciate but we never apologize for our tears because we know that the work is hard and so Rachel Stone just put in the chat it's okay right? it is okay right the work is really hard and all of us are lifting something that some of us might not know um the weight or the scale or um but I hope that everyone but, it's worth it. also, but I really hope that everyone on the call also saw the grace we extended to each other and the love and support and it was immediate right and I think that that's what we need more let us rally to support and hold space for each other because the it, it is hard it feels hard it feels weighty um but it, it's a little bit lightened when I have people like Sophia and Susan who are constantly in the corner my beautiful team and the community partner so thank you for that that moment of, of compassion thank you and that and you feel called to do the work and I've talked about calling so often and for me, it comes from God, but I've published on calling and it can be, you can feel called and not be religious at all, right? Um, but that calling, when you know that you, are in the right space with the right background, with the, with the voice that you have developed and you feel called to represent and move, it's hard not to lean in. It's not hard not to lean in. Um, so now we've got Sophia teary-eyed too. So let me get Sophia the next question. This one's good for you because you've got those three kids and they're all still home, aren't they? Or do you have any that's, okay, they're all still in the house. So here's um, a question. Men can go all, you know, all in on their careers and make all the sacrifices to achieve higher roles and more pay, but it's harder for working moms. And this uh, person says, I'm in my early, in my career with two small children. How can I combat the anxiety tied um, with keeping up? That whole, you know, the, and, and it's not just in Utah and women in Utah. There's so many publications that, uh, and research studies that we all struggle with that. Any thoughts? You're the perfect one to answer this. And you were yeah. able to take a little bit of space and have a part-time role. But you've been full time, it seems like, through, yeah. through a lot. Well, and, you know, I guess what I would say is don't worry about keeping up. Just oh. do what's right for you. Do do what's right for you and what you need. Um, you know, every family is different. Every person's different. Um, and you, this is your life. You know, it's your life to live. You need to do what's right for you. Um for me, I, yes, I did take a little bit of time, but you know, I learned during that time off that I, I needed to do something in my professional world for me to be fully whole. Um, that's not, I, I don't project that on others because everybody's different, but I knew for me, that's what I needed to be uh, a fully whole person and to make me the best parent I can be for my kids. Um, because it was affecting me, um, you know, uh, early on. And, and that's what I learned about myself. But what I learned is if I'm taking, you know, steps to be a more whole person in, in what me as a human ne needs to be able to contribute and feel, you know, uh, um, productive and, uh, you know, mentally healthy, that that, uh, you know, when I said earlier that my demeanor, I realized my demeanor impacts others around me, mm -hmm. it, it comes back to that. I, if, I, if I'm doing that and I know that that's what I need mentally, um, then I'm going to be a healthier mom for my kids. And um, there's a lot you can teach by just doing as well. Uh, you can, you know, teach your kids by example and leading by example. There's many ways to do that. And so I would just say, don't worry about keeping up, you know, you just do what's, what's right for you. I had to take a break because I, you know, that's what I was going on. I would just say life happens in stages and chapters, and it's not the same chapter for all of your life either. And, you know, I, I, say, you know, I, I've recruited a lot of moms that I was pregnant with back in the day. And, you know, they took time off uh, to be stay at home moms. And, and I think that's wonderful. And I was able to recruit them back now that their kids are older. And, you know, um, 
life happens in stages. And so you do what's best for you in the chapter you're in and everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about the past. Just focus on being the best you you can be in the chapter you're in right now. And it, it will be fine. It will work out. But that's that's what I, I love say. it. I love so, it. I love it. And and we I have to say, Nubi and I've been engaged in so many of these conversations that there's more options and there's going to be changes in workforce or workplaces in the next couple of years where there's return shifts. So even if you're out for 20 years, you have, have a good mind still and you have so much to offer or moving in and out or part-time work. Nubia, you had, had a comment. Well, yes. No, I mean, I just love what Sophia shared right now. Well, I don't have children. I do just want you all to know that Lieutenant Governor Henderson, the right most influential female leader in our state, was a mom that took time off, right? Raised her children, um, supported her family, um, and then decided to to run for for the legislature. And then she is now our lieutenant governor. And, and she recently graduated from college with her bachelor's. She has a beautiful story of this, this incredible example of chapters and what's right for you in that moment. Um, and because of that, right, we have in the administration through the lieutenant governor's leadership championed the return to Utah program. So if you are someone that is so worried about how do I get my foot in the door if I have taken time away, remember that your skill sets are translatable. Your skill sets can transfer. When people are just like, but I'm just a mom, I interrupt that immediately because there is nothing just about what you have done. You organize, you, right? You are a master scheduler. You ensure a team morale. There's all these things yes. that you do in the home that would be a huge asset for an office space. So please just listen very, very closely to what Sophia said. Chapters, stages, do what's right for you. And there are doors that are opening and the one that is yours will open when the time is right. But trust again, that even within state government, we are cognizant of the changing families in our state and how that's part of our workforce. And we need to think about the strategies to retain and recruit the best talent in Utah. I love it. I am looking at the time. Oh my gosh, that last like 40 minutes went super quick. I'm like, we have 20 minutes left and I, we don't. We just have a few minutes. So I have a few closing questions, just some quick responses from each of you. Sophia, a, do a few resources, a book that you love or, or resources that you would suggest or recommend to those watching today that have helped you develop and, and is on your mind. And then same question to Nubia. Yeah. Oh, it's a tough question because I, I listen to a lot of podcasts that likely no one else would want to listen to <laughs> the economy and all different stuff. So, uh, but, you know, maybe I'll just make a quick plug uh, for state government, because I know you're listening to this and there might be interested. And like Nubia says, you know, we need a lot of good people in state government. So and maybe I could just make a plug that we need you at the table, um, whether it be in the policymaking space or in the executive branch where we're implementing policy, um, you are needed and there's room for you at the table. And so what I might suggest is to like go, uh, there's there's so many different ways to get um, involved, plugged in. You can watch our legislative session all virtually and participate and see where your interests are. If you know where your passions and interests are, there's a, a gazillion interest groups uh, on the Hill. If, if you're wanting to get into, you know, um, the activist type of work, or if you're wanting to get involved in state government, we have so many boards and commissions uh, where we could use help and input. And we'll share uh, that link, Sophia. Yes, uh, thank you. Up email. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so always seeking good people uh, to serve in different boards and um, commissions, uh, you know, reach out, express interests um, and, and so many ways to get involved. So I just want to first and foremost, encourage you to get involved, follow the great things that um, is being uh, advertised here through, you know, Susan Madsen and uh, Dr. Susan Madsen oh, and all of the things that she's putting out there. Um, the Women's Leadership Institute also is another. Um, I, there's there's so many ways to get involved and, and we also need 
more women to run for office. Uh, so, you know, if you have some courage to, to do something wild, uh, you can look into that too, but, um, but, uh, take advantage of that email chain that gets sent out, uh, uh, by Dr. Madsen, and they're, they're all listed in there. And I would just say, just take a few minutes, read through that, and, you know, the call to action would be to do, to pick up one activity or event or something in her email and and pick one of those things and get involved. And, and I think that's a great start. Thank you so much. And, and, and wanted to, and Nubia, I know you probably want to answer that question, but I'm going to ask you a different one because we're always you know, you know very well because you are one that that I've talked to from the very start of the Boulder Way Forward, which is a seven year societal change movement to really ensure that more Utah girls and women thrive in any setting. What do you think are two of the most important things that need to be done here in Utah to really move us forward? That's a great question, Susan. Thank you. And yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we've we've got some work to do. We're making strides, but there's always room. And I think the data is going to be so important for us to make sure that we are data informed uh, whenever we're developing our strategies, that we understand the existing gaps that exist for our communities. Um, also, making sure that we are active bystanders. When we see harm, we engage, we disrupt. And that is across every spectrum, right? If we see sexism, racism, if we see harm, we unequivocally will step in. Um, so changing culture, understanding um, the value of women in positions of leadership, um, making sure that we are not having these discussions to the exclusion of men and our allies who are very much championing us and helping open doors, um, that we challenge the scarcity mentality because in fact we can thrive and that we look to policies that can make um, thriving the priority for every family in our state. Thank you so much to both, both of you today, Nubia and Sophia. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, and uh, just, just very grateful you were both. And also thank you for um, to our sponsors, UEN, uh, the John M. Huntsman School of Business and USU Extension for making this event possible. Thanks to all of you for listening in. Have a wonderful rest of your day.